Hello and welcome to Unheard, I'm Freddie Sayers. Have you noticed that certain big figures from Silicon Valley are starting to take a strongly dissenting line over the war in Ukraine? Elon Musk has caused quite a storm by suggesting that a deal with Vladimir Putin needs to be done urgently, even if it involves surrendering parts of eastern Ukraine. All of this is to avoid the risk of nuclear conflict. He's not the only one. David Sachs was another co-founder of PayPal alongside Elon Musk. In fact, he was the COO of PayPal, and he and Elon Musk have been mutually tweeting each other on the topic of Ukraine. Now he is founder and general partner at Craft Ventures, and he is a co-host of the hit podcast All In. Happily, he joins us from California to tell us a bit more. Hi, David. Hey, Freddie. Good to be with you. Before we get started with David Sachs, a quick word of thanks to our sponsors for this episode of Unheard TV, Macro Hive. Macro Hive is a leading provider of investment research that has now become one of the most respected and independent voices in finance. They offer insights into everything from geopolitics to inflation and central bank policy, and their clients are wealth managers and private investors. Now, more than ever, protecting investments and making smart, long-term decisions is crucial. So they've created something called Macro Hive Lite, which is a free weekly newsletter where their pros cover the biggest stories and reveal trade ideas on stocks, FX, commodities, and more. If you like the sound of that and would like to sign up, just visit macrohive.com. It goes without saying that Macrohive is an independent organization and does not subscribe necessarily to any of the views expressed in this episode. Now, back to David Sachs. So let's just start by trying to understand what your position on Ukraine actually is, because it's been quite controversial the past few weeks. You, you published a piece, I think it was in Newsweek, called Woke War 3, which basically laid out how you felt some political ideas are leading us in quite a dangerous direction. Give us your position as you would set it out. Right. Well, my concern is that, uh, let's call them woke cancellation tactics, are being used to silence a part of this debate or discussion, which is how do we find a diplomatic solution to end this Ukraine war? And if you put forward any idea for a peace settlement, then you are portrayed as being a Putin sympathizer or sycophant or something like that. You saw that with Elon. He put forward this pretty reasonable peace proposal that I think the contours of which have been defined for over a year. Many people have put forward a proposal like that. And in fact, Zelensky seemed to be entertaining proposals like that at the beginning of the war. And yet he was denounced as being sort of this uh, Putin puppet. And in fact, even I think Anne Applebaum and uh, David Frum accused him of actually being a messenger for the Kremlin without any evidence whatsoever. This is pretty pretty standard stuff, even though Elon and his company SpaceX have given Starlink to the Ukrainian war effort at an out-of-pocket cost themselves of $20 million a month. So there's very little room right now in the public conversation to even raise the idea of, of a negotiated settlement. And my view on it is that proposing peace or a negotiation is not pro-Russian. We, we should be looking to do what's in the American interest. I'm not on the Russian side or the Ukrainian side per se. I'm on the American side. Essentially, the idea of proposing a peace settlement has become morally unacceptable. Right, right. You're accused of being on the Russian side if, you're, if you suggest any form of negotiated peace. And um, I just think that's not right. I mean, we'd never get to any negotiated peace in any conflict if you had that attitude that it would be serving only the other side's interests. Um, so are you, you know, roughly the, with with Elon in terms of trying to understand what kind of settlement you think would be logical. Uh, he tweeted out um, a map of a recent political result which showed a very clear divide within Ukraine between kind of more Russian sympathizing areas. The implication being that might form the, the sort of baseline for some kind of partition almost of Ukraine. And that, of course, was highly controversial. Are you with Elon on that? Well, I think there's three regions of Ukraine that are going to need to be dealt with separately if you want to create a lasting peace here. So you've got the western portion of the country called the western 80 or 90 percent, which is more aligned with the west. You then got this eastern part, this Donbass region, call it 10 to 20 percent of the country, that is ethnically divided and has been the location of a civil war that's gone back roughly eight years. 
And you're going to need a different solution for that area. And then finally, you've got Crimea, which is majority Russian, ethnically Russian, something like 60% of the population consider themselves to be Russian. Three quarters of Crimea in polling that was done by Gallup and a German polling company back in 2015 said that they wanted to go with Russia. And it's, and it's um, it, you know, Crimea was annexed by Russia in 2014. That's sort of a fait accompli. So I think that the start of a negotiated settlement would be to realize that the three regions are very different um, in terms of their history and ethnicities. And if you want to actually create a lasting peace, you're going to have to deal with each of these uh, separately. So I think, you know, the, the, the broad contours of a deal, I think, have been understood for some time, which is for the western part of the country, you would, uh, you would basically, uh, you'd invest in economic development. You, Ukraine could become part of the EU. Uh, Putin, for what it's worth, has said that Ukraine could become part of the EU. But you would take NATO expansion off the table because Russia perceives that as a threat. With respect to Crimea, you recognize the fait accompli that Crimea was annexed by Russia in 2014. The majority of people who live there want to go with Russia. That's not appeasement. That is self-determination. And then with respect to Donbass, I mean, the issue there is just it's one of these sort of messy, ethnically divided areas, and no solution is going to fully satisfy everybody there. That's why there's been an ethnic civil war going back uh, eight years there. So, so, but what solution could we be looking for there? Because I think my sense is that Crimea is less controversial to talk about. Even people who are very, very supportive of the kind of Western efforts in Ukraine, if you press them, will accept that there's no realistic chance of Crimea suddenly becoming a normal part of Ukraine anytime soon. But the Donbass is really the the sort of conflict within Western conversations, because you know, what do you do with it? Does it just become part of Russia? Does it become some special administrative zone? In which case, who administers it? This is where people right. fall down. Well, we had a solution for this under the Minsk Accords, which basically said that the Donbass region would remain part of Ukraine, but they'd have substantial autonomy. And the problem is, one of the problems leading up to this war is that Ukraine and the United States did not ultimately support the implementation of Minsk. And so, for example, you got uh, laws passed in Kyiv to ban the speaking of Russian in that part of the country. And so the, the, the problem is we've had workable solutions for Donbass that involved that region staying part of Ukraine but with substantial autonomy, uh, and they weren't respected. I don't think there is necessarily a perfect solution for this region. And I think the question for the United States is, what are we willing to accept what's in our interest? My question, I guess, would be at this point, is that really an option that Putin would accept anymore to say those parts would still be part of Ukraine, but there'll be special privileges? Doesn't feel like it from the rhetoric coming out of Moscow. Right. Perhaps not. I mean, perhaps not. I think that um, we could have had a solution to this conflict much more easily a year ago. Uh, and we never took advantage of, of those opportunities for diplomacy. So the solution you're likely to get now may be worse. I think that's entirely... I think that's entirely correct. Give us a hint. What, what, what do you think we might be looking at now? Well, I, I guess it depends on how things go on the ground. Um, but, uh, but the question really should be what's acceptable to the United States of America. And the reality is that the United States does not have a vital interest in who rules the Donbass, whether it's a Ukrainian oligarch or a Russian oligarch who ultimately presides there. We should just want to find a solution, a settlement that is – basically acceptable to the people who live there. And the settlement is always going to be a little bit messy because this is one of those ethnically divided areas a la the Balkans where people have been in a civil war with each other. And um, and I understand that Russia has been fueling that by funding separatists in, those reg in that region. But um, ultimately, I think there should be a range of outcomes here that are acceptable to the United States. So that's almost like the kind of it's a, it's a more traditional way of resolving a regional dispute where essentially the grand powers get together and carve it up and say, well, to, to create, to stop this escalating, let's just do this. And whether the local people are happy about it, 100% or not, doesn't. Well, no, I think, I, I, don't think, I don't think we're the ones carving it up. I think the principle here is we should broadly follow what the people of that area want. I mean, the principle here should be self-determination, not appeasement. And... Uh, and, and it's, not, it's not about us carving it up. It's about 
what are we willing to accept? Because the fact of the matter is that we could have avoided this war if we were willing to take NATO expansion off the table and recognize the Minsk Accords. So it's not like the United States has just been uh, sitting on the sidelines. The, the Biden administration has sort of this, this passive aggressive framing that, oh, we just need to support whatever the Ukrainians want, that you know, we're, we're not really involved in this. But the truth of the matter is that we've been highly involved in this region since 2014, if not before. We gave support to the Maidan revolution or coup, dep- depending on what, what you want to call it. And we refused to give support to the Minsk Accords that could have resolved this conflict in eastern Ukraine. So we have been very involved there and uh, trying to convert Ukraine into a member of NATO and into a Western bulwark on Russia's border is a long-term project of our State Department. And our actions there have helped pressurize this situation. And now we pretend like we just have to defer to our client Zelensky and basically do whatever he wants that's you know, that's that's a charade. I mean, so, so your, your 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 view then is basically we should extract and and stop being so involved and essentially leave to the 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 future of Ukraine to whatever happens in the region. It shouldn't be an American priority to dictate the terms. Well, no, no American president has ever asserted that the United States has a vital interest in Ukraine or any part of Ukraine. It's simply not. Even Biden himself at the beginning of the war, made clear that we would not get directly involved in the fighting. He rejected a no-fly zone, which would have required us to shoot down Russian planes. And even when goaded by the press, remember that interview with Lester Holt at the beginning of the war, where he was, where Biden was asked, you know, Mr. President, what if there's Americans trapped behind enemy lines? Would you send in our troops to go get them? And Biden said, no, we, we won't, because we cannot risk a shooting war with Russia. So at the beginning of this war, we were very clear that the U.S. would not get directly involved because we did not have an interest that rose to the level of a vital interest. And yet, here we are eight or nine months later, and we've been going down this slippery slope, and people are so, I I guess, swept up in the the war fever and in their moral condemnation of the Russian side that we've been getting progressively more and more involved. Let's try to work out what's really going on then. Where do you think this war fever really originates? There's There's a few different arguments flying around. I want to throw a couple of your way and see how you respond to them. The first is a sort of practical realpolitik argument, which a lot of people make in defense of this, which is if you if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile, basically. If you if, if Vladimir Putin senses weakness on the part of the West and that we essentially surrender or, or lose interest, other areas like whether it's Poland or the Baltic states or some part of uh, Asia would now become vulnerable. What do you say to that argument? Well, a couple of things. So, so I understand that's the dominant narrative is that uh, this war began on February 24th. There was no prehistory to it. Vladimir Putin just went nuts on February 24th and indulged his desire for imperial conquest and to try and reincorporate Ukraine into a greater Soviet Union or, or Russian empire. I understand that's the, the dominant narrative. And in that framing, uh, you know, Putin is the second coming of Hitler. And if we basically give him one square inch of territory. It's only going to whet his appetite. That would be appeasement. I think there's a couple of problems with that. The first is that, um, first of all, if the Ukraine war has shown anything, it is that Russia is not strong enough. They're not militarily capable enough to pose a threat to all of Europe. Even before the war, it was the case that Russia's economy was one-tenth the size of the EU's, and its population was roughly a third, and its life expectancy was much lower. It was a aging population that wasn't even replacing itself at a sort of reproducing at replacement rate. So this idea that Russia posed a threat to uh, to all of Europe or to NATO, I think was always threat inflation. Uh, it simply didn't have the capabilities, even if Putin had the intent. But that kind of brings me to the second point, which is I fundamentally have questions about that narrative, because I don't think this conflict started on February 24th. If you go back and look at at experts, the sort of realist camp, who were writing about this issue going back to 2014 and even the late 90s, they were raising the specter that the West's attempt to bring NATO right up to Russia's front porch would ultimately be seen by Moscow as a provocation and result in a poisoning of relations between the, the West and Russia and could eventually lead to a, a, a conflict, a war. 
And, um, and the problem is just that those thinkers, uh, those IR uh, scholars simply this aren't This is John Mearsheimer uh, and that group. Yeah, I mean, you go back all the way to the late 90s and you've got George Kennan, the architect of our Cold War containment policy, who said that uh, expanding NATO eastward uh, all the way up to, to Russia's front porch would be a tragic mistake that would create hostility uh, within Russia, could even lead to the rise of a strongman. And that when we finally got in a conflict with them, Kennan predicted that we would say, see, the, the Russians were always like that. Um, so then in 2008, when we, um, when we issued the Bucharest Declaration that we intended to bring Ukraine into NATO, you had our own ambassador to Russia, who is now the CIA director, Bill Burns, write his famous memo back to the then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, the memo Nyet means Nyet, saying that bringing, uh, bringing Ukraine into NATO is a red line for all Russian elites, not just Putin. And then in 2014, you had IR scholars like Mearsheimer and Kissinger basically say that the solution here to de-escalate the crisis is to declare that Ukraine should be neutral. It should not be brought into NATO. Instead, we should pursue economic development for Ukraine, but that militarily, Ukraine needed to remain a buffer state between the West and, uh, and, and Russia because our attempts to bring them into NATO was seen as um, threatening to to Moscow, and so so the I guess the argument then is given that more complex reading of the history, where there was risk taking and threatening t taking place on both sides, it becomes like a risk reward calculation that actually the risk of continuing to prosecute the war in this manner ends up being greater than the risk of stepping back and seeing what happens. Is is that how you think well, of it? Well, I, I guess there's just this fundamental question about what is motivating Moscow. What what is motivating this Russian aggression? There's no question that uh, Russia has engaged in this invasion. It's barbaric. It's it's heinous. The question is why. And the only narrative you'll hear in the media is this idea that it's motivated by these imperial dreams, or maybe sort of this kleptocracy, like Putin is just going to steal whatever he can. Um, but I think there is this alternate reading of the situation by this sort of realist camp, um, you know, the Mearsheimer, and also people like Jeffrey Sachs, um, the international development economist, who say, well, no, that actually the motivation here is Russian insecurity, their historic sense of vulnerability and paranoia that we've been fueling by bringing American troops, weapons, and bases right onto their most vulnerable border, which is Ukraine. Are there some strategic interests that benefit the United States that are actually served by this? I mean, do you think there's, whether it is yeah. increased gas sales to Europe or whether it is the defense industry or whatever, do you have any sympathy with that view that actually there is kind of, there's an appetite for war within the American establishment? I don't know ultimately if, if that's the motivation. Hanlon's razor says never attribute to malice what you can attribute to stupidity. I think it may just be obtuseness and stubbornness and a refusal to put yourself in the other guy's shoes, which should be the fundamental principle for diplomats. Uh, I think it could be all of those things really playing into this decision. But there's no question, there's no question there's interest groups in Washington who, uh, who do see a, a larger aim here. You've put forward the argument that there's a co collaboration between the, the woke left, as you call it, with a kind of warmongering right. Do you think there's any chance of a kind of parallel horseshoe politics happening at the same time? I mean, there are still some voices from the old anti-war left. And then, of course, you have people like Tucker Carlson on the so-called new right in the US who are also um, against it. Do you, do you think there's a parallel sort of left-right alliance potentially going on there? Well, I'd hoped that to be the case, but just in the last few days, you had this spectacle of 30 progressive members of the House put out this letter, which was a very tepid letter simply calling for the opening of a diplomatic track in parallel to our unlimited support, virtually unlimited support, militarily for Ukraine. And in response to this, this letter provoked such a furor that the, virtually all of this, the signers uh, renounced the letter within less than a day. Again, it didn't question our policy towards Ukraine. It didn't say that we weren't going to support them militarily. It just said that let's open a uh, diplomatic channel with Russia to 
help avoid the potential risk of nuclear war. And even that, even that uh, relatively anodyne letter had to be uh, denounced, and um, and the signatories, virtually all of them, uh, disavowed it. So unfortunately, there is no more anti-war left, as far as I can tell. The uh, the 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 member of Congress who you'd expect to be the most vocal, outspoken critic of the war would be someone like Bernie Sanders, and uh, Sanders basically has totally embraced it and has no criticisms whatsoever of our conduct in the war, our uh, our support for Ukraine or how we got here. So there doesn't seem to be much of a uh, anti-war left. Why know. do you think it's left to people like you and indeed Elon Musk and some of these sort of big tech spokespeople? Why is it, do you think it's that group that has become the vocal group of dissent? It's not necessarily what you'd expect. What's the sort of ideological or political reason for that? I think it's simply that we're not part of this foreign policy establishment that is very clubby and sort of an insider's club where you have to have the right view in order to advance your career and get a job in the State Department or a think tank. We're not beholden to any of that. We're not beholden to the military industrial complex. We can just say what we think. And um, in my case, it's really just a result of me reading widely about this issue and discovering that there were all these thinkers in this realist uh, school who, again, predicted the crisis. They foresaw what would happen. And I just think that this theory provides a much more complete explanation of what's happening. And therefore, it provides, I think, a clearer understanding of how we get out of this situation before it could escalate into something even more tragic than what's already occurred. I guess you've also got wealth and position, and you're hard to cancel. And Elon Musk, obviously, even more so. Do you think that has something to do with it? That now it's these kind of big barons who are powerful enough to say what they really think because they're not afraid of, as you call it, the woke mob? Well, ironically, there are plenty of wealthy uh, tech elites who are afraid to say what they really think um, because they're afraid of losing status. It's a different kind of game. Uh, but you're right that it does take a certain kind of person who's just willing to say what they think and not really care whether they get denounced by this online mob. Do you think you're winning the argument? I mean, I don't know what the <laughs> atmosphere is where you are in California. Do you feel like people are sort of turning their shoulder and are upset by what you've said publicly? Or are people secretly supportive? I mean, sometimes in these scenarios where there's like a heavy censorship price to pay, people say, well, actually, I kind of agree with you, but I wouldn't want to say it publicly. What is your experience? Do you think there is a, yeah. a body of support for your view? Yeah, I think that there, there, there is more support than is probably, um, that, 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 that there, there is a body of support that may not be willing to speak out publicly because there is such pressure here not to say anything that be, could be construed and get you labeled as being pro-Putin or whatever. I mean, these um, intimidation tactics that are being used are real. And so I think they do have an effect. I have no doubt that the majority of the American people have no interest in getting in a nuclear war with Russia over any part of Ukraine. So I have no doubt that the opinions I hold are common sense among the American people, but they are not. They are actively discouraged and silenced and intimidated uh, among the media and, and, and these sort of the foreign policy elite. Final question for you, which is a little bit mm -hmm. moving on from Ukraine, but it's, it's relevant because we recently had this controversy over PayPal that was going to fine people who had broken their terms of service or had indulged in misinformation, I think was the crime. They then uh, withdrew that, but it fits into this pattern where big technologies such as the one you helped to, to create are now weaponized or employed in yeah, disciplining a party line and making sure that it's enforced. What's your view on that? Is, how dangerous is it? And, and do you think there's any way of reversing it? Well, it's ironic that at the same time we say we're in a global struggle against autocracy and authoritarianism, that we increasingly are embracing authoritarian tactics at home. Uh, you're seeing increasing censorship. You see people uh, within 
the, the Democratic Party basically say they don't support free speech anymore. You see financial deplatforming, like what PayPal is doing, based on people's political viewpoints. If you don't have the correct views according to them, they're going to cut you off from the financial system. They're going to prevent your ability to take payments or presumably earn a living. They're basically – these are tactics to starve out the opposition, not just silence through – revoking their speech rights, but also to potentially take away their right to make a living. So you're seeing these increasing authoritarian tactics uh, at home, and it's all justified in the name of democracy. And so you've had this weird fusion, I think, um, it, under the Biden presidency. Biden has basically declared that we are engaged in a global struggle against autocracy, both at home and abroad. He sort of fused this sort of foreign policy and domestic policy into this Manichaean struggle against uh, dictatorship anywhere in the world. But the problem with that is that uh, anything we don't like is labeled dictatorship. So it can be, um, you know, even democratically elected leaders like Viktor Orban, I think, won three times in Hungary or Maloney in Italy or even Donald Trump. They are, th that is basically a threat to democracy, even though they're democratically elected. And then meanwhile, these authoritarian tactics like unprovoked invasions or um, or sanction regimes or censorship or deplatforming or selective prosecution. Uh, these things are all justified in the name of democracy. So, um, But do you see yourself as part of a yeah. fight back against this? And, and should we be hopeful, do you think, that if, for example, the Musk deal to take over Twitter goes through, it may even have gone through by the time this video airs, do you think that is the beginning of a fight back and that some sort of alternative, more pro-free speech, pro-freedom media might come about? Yeah, that, that's, 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 that's the hope for sure, is, um, is that this is the beginning of a pushback against this wave of censorship and deplatforming. Um, I am concerned with this larger movement that's taking place here, which is that our civil liberties are increasingly jeopardized by, again, what Biden has labeled this global struggle that, again, he perceives as being both domestic and foreign. And it's really scary to think about the ways in which the security state could be applied to domestic political opposition. And we've seen hints of this. You saw that the Homeland Security Department had that attempt to create basically a ministry of truth, that they were going to create uh, an, an organization to define disinformation. This is the part of our government that has domestically has all the guns and for them to be just, just defining what uh, misinformation is. And then they included this idea of misinformation in their definition of terrorism. So there have been these hints and warnings that, that the powers of the state are going to be used to crack down on domestic political opposition. And again, it's framed in this, this sort of Manichaean way that is somehow part of this global struggle. And of course, anybody who wants to raise a question about what we're doing in Ukraine is labeled pro-Putin, and the domestic opposition is, is labeled pro-Putin as well. So it's this scary metastizing of, uh, of our culture war into something, I think, much more dangerous. You know, a lot of people thought that the culture war was just sort of this sideshow and wasn't really relevant to our politics, but now it has sort of metastized into something, uh, I think, much scarier. I know I said the last one was the final question. This is the final, final yeah. question. <laughs> Which way do you think it's going to go? Because you've talked about the beginnings of a fight back, but then there's a lot of establishment power on the side of this more authoritarian sort of moral clarity way of seeing things. You're not a, you know, sage. You can't necessarily predict the future, but right. what's your instinct? Do you think the fight back will win? Do you think this, this way of seeing the world will, will break down? Or do you think we're headed for more authoritarian times down the road? Well, this is the big battle. And I think it depends on how the battle is met and how it's resisted. And um, I do think that Elon buying Twitter, if that succeeds, uh, will be helpful in the sense that Elon has said that he believes in free speech, not censorship. And hopefully that'll inspire other people to push back against these authoritarian tendencies in the West. And to be clear, I'm no fan of authoritarianism. Uh, I think it's a very unattractive feature of government. Uh, I'm not a fan of uh, authoritarianism in Russia, for example. I just don't know that we need to be declaring war all over the world against it. I think what we should be doing is focusing 
on our own politics and maintaining our own civil liberties and freedoms. That should be the first priority. And again, it would be ironic if in our zeal, in our crusade to battle authoritarianism abroad, that we give up our fundamental civil liberties at home, uh, our rights to free speech, our rights to make a living, our rights to be free from political prosecution. And increasingly, those things are at risk. And they're at risk because we have um, a party that's in control of our government that sees these causes as synonymous. Uh, that's very scary. David Sachs, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks, Freddie. That was David Sachs, Silicon Valley mogul, co-founder and CEO back in the day of PayPal, now a big investor in Silicon Valley, and alongside Elon Musk, one of the more vocal voices for a different way of approaching the Ukraine question. Whether you agree with him or not, it seems fair that he should be heard. He's a serious guy, and I certainly found it interesting. I hope you did too. This was Unheard. <laughs>